Welcome to First Words, a podcast presented by the First United Methodist Church of Florence. Today's message is brought to you by Youth Director Mac Nolan. The pinky swear is often used by children as a way to form a pact or solidify a friendship. Oftentimes, we as adults regard this practice as cutesy or juvenile, but for children, this gesture is taken very seriously. A pinky promise, whether exchanged by the swings of a playground or in the dark between two siblings, is solemn. It is an oath between children. Both parties operate on the same understanding that a pinky swear is not to be broken, as if their very lives hang in the balance of the words spoken over their interlocked fingers. I promise we'll be friends forever. I promise I'll never tell anyone what you just told me. For adults, pinky promises are a little harder to come by. At any point that I've been encountering a pinky promise in my adult life, it has been at the request of a child. Knowing how seriously children take these promises, adults often oblige as a form of reassurance to the child, rather than the action actually representing a legitimate form of trust. And so while maybe the pinky swear doesn't carry as much weight to the adult as it does to the child, it does show that the relationship is important enough that it merits playing along to show the child that you understand why it might be important to them. At some point, I suspect we've all broken a promise or two in our lives. Maybe you've had someone break a promise that they made to you. If you're anything like me, the easiest types of promises to break are the promises that you make yourself. I promise I'll work out tomorrow. I promise tomorrow I'll speak more kindly to myself. And if you're anything like my mom, the easiest types of promises to break are the ones you never had any intention of keeping. Like, I promise we can get ice cream after dinner. All joking aside, and regardless of how good we are at keeping or following through on our promises, we're all guilty of making promises because we don't want to let the other person down. We want them to know that we care, that we value the relationship, and that their trust is meaningful to us. Deep down, I suspect that we make promises because we want to be the type of people who are capable of keeping them. Now in the Bible, there are tons of promises. In the Old Testament, we often call these covenants, we see God promise Abraham lots of children. God promised Moses and the Israelites freedom from slavery. God promised Noah that he will never flood the earth again. In the New Testament, we see the life and death of Jesus as a promise of our salvation. Like us, God makes promises to show us that our needs and desires matter to God. Unlike us, God never breaks God's promises. In today's lectionary reading, which comes from the end of Luke, we find Jesus and his disciples having their last earthly conversation before Jesus will ascend into heaven. Because Luke is the only gospel writer who attributes a time and place to the ascension, we can reasonably assume that this is happening somewhere on the Mount of Olives. During this time, according to Luke, Jesus begins by reminding the disciples all of these events have been foretold in the Old Testament scriptures. This was always going to happen. And this is Jesus' first hint at the coming promises. I believe there are three. We'll get to that in a second. But by highlighting the prophecy and fulfillment in the Old Testament, what Jesus is really showing the disciples is that what God has been doing and planning was the plan all along. In other words, God has been faithful generations before the disciples were even born and will continue to be faithful generations after the disciples are dead. This would have been a little tricky for the disciples to understand, so Luke says that Jesus opened the minds to understand their scriptures. 
This is going to be the crux of early Christian teachings and preaching. As I said a moment ago, I believe Jesus left the disciples with three promises before he ascended into heaven. And while these promises weren't written directly to us, they certainly matter to us. What I mean is, though the disciples were the original recipients of Jesus' promises here, that doesn't exclude them from being for us. The first of these three promises is found in Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47. Jesus said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that the repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. You are witnesses to these things. In the message translation, Jesus says, you're the first to hear and to see this. You are the witnesses. Jesus is not only telling the disciples that what they're, they have witnessed and are about to witness is going to be the start of an entire movement of Christianity, Jesus is promising that they can do this. Considering the disciples had had problems throughout the course of Jesus' life, understanding what Jesus was telling them was going to happen, it's really no surprise that they may have needed this reassurance from him. He knew that they weren't necessarily ready to preach a crucified and risen savior, and that their own political inclinations would make it difficult for them to want to take this news anywhere else. But Jesus also knew and trusted that his early followers were the right people to do just that. They just needed him to show them how. As modern Christians, though our beliefs and practices vary, we can't exist outside of our faith traditions. We haven't inherited our faith from generations before, and therefore we have a unique obligation to uphold and relay our Christian history. When we read and interpret scripture, preach the gospel, and share communal faith, we act as a part of a larger faith community. So whether you have been a Christian for 20 years or 20 minutes, you are a witness to the entire God story that came before you. Likewise, as Christians, we also have an obligation to not only see, but to name where God is at work in our lives and the lives of those around us. Jesus' promise is that we are continual witnesses, that there is always something going on in the world around us. And our job is to respond with awareness of this and the courage to say what we see. The second promise Jesus leaves us is lifted from Luke chapter 24, verse 49, which reads, Look, I'm sending you what my father promised, but you are to stay in the city until you have been furnished with heavenly power. While what Jesus is actually saying is that the Holy Spirit is on its way, what Jesus is promising is that the disciples won't be alone. Jesus is promising them a co-counselor for their endeavors. Like I said earlier, the disciples may have been having their doubts about the commission Jesus was giving them. It was certainly a daunting task to take this to all nations, and it was coming on the heels of a pretty dramatic time for them. They were emotional. The promise of the Holy Spirit then was a reassurance that the disciples would not be alone, that they would remain divinely inspired and empowered for the task ahead. Though the gift of the Holy Spirit came that first Pentecost, the Spirit and its power are present with us today. Each gospel writer has a slightly differing perspective on what the Holy Spirit really means, but for the author of Luke, the Holy Spirit's job is to empower the church for its mission in the world. And it's important to note here that the use of church is referring to the global church, a collective of individuals, rather than any particular building or denomination. In our lives, the Holy Spirit often appears as a prompting, an inkling that we should say, do, or act in a way contrary than what we might instinctively want. 
For theologian Fred Craddock, he claims that this can be unsettling. As for generations, the Spirit has moved the church into areas in which it otherwise may not have gone and into activities in which it otherwise may not have engaged. Since the movement of the Spirit is beyond intellect and often unnoticed in the moment, our response to Jesus' promise that the Holy Spirit is with us is a promise that we will not only follow the promptings of the Holy Spirit, but take time to reflect on the relation of our actions to the Spirit. The third promise that Jesus left at the time of his ascension is actually lifted from the ascension narrative in Acts chapter 1, which as Dale reminded us, it's technically the same author as Luke, so I think that that counts. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11 recount. When Jesus had said all this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Jesus will come in the same way the disciples saw him taken up into heaven. So the final promise from Jesus is that he plans to see the disciples again. He will see them again. His final reminder was a promise that they would be together, a reassurance that he wasn't gone for good. And this promise is twofold. Firstly, it's an act of comfort. His friends had already grieved him once, and he was about to leave them again. He was telling them it's not a forever goodbye. And when we're reunited, it will be even better than before. Secondly, this promise is an empowering message. The accounts found in Acts and the preaching of the early church hinged on the idea that Jesus was coming back soon. So there was no time to waste in spreading the word and mission of Christ. Though I personally don't spend a lot of my free time thinking about the logistics of the second coming of Christ, I am drawn to what it could mean for my relationship with Jesus. In John Wesley's work on the new creation, he discusses all these various ways in which the earth will be changed at the time of the second coming. However, Wesley also concurs that the change awaiting humans is the most glorious of all, and that it will far surpass even our wildest imaginations. Pain, suffering, and sinfulness will cease to exist. It will be better than what Adam and Eve experienced at the start of their time in the garden. The result will be, as Wesley puts it, a deep, intimate, and uninterrupted union with God, Jesus Christ, through the Spirit. Jesus' promise that he will one day return not only gives us hope for the now, but hope for the day when we are fully in the presence of God again. After the ascension of Jesus, it would have been expected for the early disciples to return to the city dejected and downtrodden at having lost their friend again. We couldn't really fault them if they had mourned for their lives in Galilee before they had met Jesus and became followers of him. But the three promises of Jesus found in the Ascension actually allowed the disciples to return to Jerusalem, feeling hopeful, full of joy, and empowered to join the work of God. My hope is, after reflecting on these and other promises of Christ, we also feel full of joy and hope and ready to join in the work of God in our world today. For United Methodists, we have our own version of pinky promises. When we join the church, and take our membership vows, we promise to uphold the church and its mission with our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. When we baptize babies in this sanctuary, 
We promise to nurture and support the child and their family in their faith journey. So today, as we move towards Pentecost, I want us to make a pinky promise as a congregation. So, and I know this is a little cheesy, but just indulge me. Pinky's up. Heavenly Father, as we wait for the celebration of Penny Pentecost, we pinky promise to be extra attentive to the movement of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for listening to First Words. For more information about our services or how to get involved in our community, visit us at fumcflorence.org or facebook.com slash florencefumc.